continue our presentation today with another uh, historical account. Uh, Henry gave a, a great thing. It's going to be continued. Uh, we will have this presentation. Then we'll have a short break in pre and uh, Lake State's image. Uh, items will be shown, and then we'll have uh, Glenn give his Martin and Smith uh, discussion. On the tables and on the chairs is a brochure from the Jeffries Foundation. Uh, we are pleased to have an unannounced guest speaker. Uh, Mr. Jeffries will uh, give us a, a little contact uh, after Glenn's presentation. So. Uh, the induction for your dad. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Mm -hmm. Hi, guys. I'm Archie Cook. I'm Cecil's oldest son, second of four children. My sister's older. Um, so we appreciate Lake State for asking Dad to come and present. He's going to present basically the same presentation he did last year at the Masabi uh, convention because his book came out. His fifth fifth book came out called The Luther Bust, and so I'll let him tell you all the fascinating railroad stuff, but I've had the pleasure there and today to actually introduce him. Um, it's kind of bittersweet, Dad's 88, and uh, you know, basically um, his passion has been railroad, railroad photography, railroad research for most of his adult life, well, all of his adult life, and uh, so uh, they went ahead and let me have a few minutes just to show you a couple of slides. One of the reasons I wanted to do it here is because mother was his constant companion. Uh, and we lost her to Alzheimer's a couple years ago. And I've already talked to some of the ladies in the audience. And they remember mom. And uh, so she, her and dad uh, were partners on Life's Railroad for 62 plus years. And, uh, so we lost her in 2017, and uh, so I wanted to just really quickly show you a little bit about Dad. Dad took his first railroad picture in 1947 in his hometown of Waukon, Iowa, and this is his very first photograph of the local branch line, one of the local branch line trains. He also spent a lot of time, he was kind of embraced by the men that ran the Waukon branch off the main line down to Marquette. And he got to actually be in the cab quite often until the railroad detectives might be in town, and then they'd make him get off a little bit early. Um, but here he is on the hand-turned turntable at Walk On. Uh, he's the one on, he's right there. Uh, and very young man, probably in his early 20s, helping the, the crew turn, hand-turn the engine around to go back down to the Mississippi from Walk On. Um, he was a founding member of the National Railroad, Railroad Historical Society, Iowa chapter. Here they've got a train the same year that they were formed in 53, and they got permission as long as they changed it back after the excursion. They're meeting at the wee hours of the morning in Cedar Rapids and painting silver trim to highlight the train. Uh, and then when they got back, they had to make sure it got kind of put back to its original state. Uh, but here he is right here helping hand paint the train. Uh, and here's the finished product, all silver highlights uh, to make it stand out more. Uh, this is his very first railroad, uh, published railroad photog uh, photograph. It is in the book Duluth or Bust. Uh, 1954, it appeared in Trains Magazine and Race maybe going to help us find the actual magazine because we can't find it anymore. Uh, but anyway, it is in the book. Uh, this is my mother, my, my grandmother, and my sister. I'm actually in this picture, but I'm in a bassinet in the seat before, and you'll see this. So this is a, a Masabi Railroad uh, excursion in the 1950s. Well, it have to be early 58 because I was born in 57. Uh, so anyway, um, Dad's always known for breaking the rules. This is our favorite family photo uh, photograph of Dad, my siblings and I. Notice that Dad is on the illegal side of the no trespassing assumption. <laughs> and this is, this is Lake Linden, Michigan. Uh, we usually stayed in the car because Mom didn't know if she'd have to drive and bail Dad out from jail. Okay, so anyway, um, 
Uh, Paul corrected me. Paul, right here, you corrected me on the date on this. I said the 1385 and 1978. I think Paul said it didn't actually come up to Boone Puffer Billy days or whatever until the early 82 80s. would have been the first but year. Anyway, I never would take be so bold as to take a train picture, so I carry Dad's extra cameras, and that's Dad, and that's me, and one of my other siblings shot a picture of both of us sometime late 70s, early 80s. The 1385 is down here by the depot in Boone, Iowa. Um, this is Dad's first book, probably the most famous, with a man by the name of Denny Rader, uh, with a book called Grass Between the Rails, 1972. This is his second book, uh, which he partnered with Denny as a publisher, but he authored it himself, and this is Marquette. This is his third book, uh, The Final Steam Years, and the year it was published. This is available on the table, and this is the book that brings us here today, and this is the new book that is hopefully going to be out yet this year, um, and it's uh, Southern Steam, uh, Southern State Steam uh, in the late years. Some of these are abandoned, setting in fields or on sidings and in pretty bad shape. Some of them are under power still. Lumber and lumber and gravel and different things like that. Probably the most, Dad's most famous photograph uh, appeared on, he's been published in most of the railroad history magazines, uh, the pontoon bridge between Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin and Marquette, Iowa. Um, He's given numerous presentations for all the historical societies in the local community in Des Moines. He's, his pictures have been published in countless books. This is one of them that I just picked. Um, his library that Paul got to see and his collection, just stuff and, and over, not a very organized. He's not a modeler, but uh, for his 80th birthday, the kids and I got together and we had a friend of his uh, scratch build uh, one of his photographs, one of his early photographs, and so now he has his own steam model uh, locomotive. And then last thing, Dad claims he never liked diesels. In fact, you, but you will find some of them, and I put this up here just to annoy him, okay? <laughs> and, and in fact, the only reason there's two pictures in the Duluth or Bus book is because I insisted that they be there for the younger generation. That, that doesn't admire, but he calls them diesel devils, and uh, basically he saw them as the downfall of his beloved steam engine. So, anyway, thank you for allowing me to at least introduce over 70 years of being obsessed with with steam locomotives. Right. Dad, you're up. Oh, oh, sorry. Can you, can you give it to him? Hold on just a second. I gotta. I'm gonna. I'm going to let him get going by just talking about the cover. The sad thing is, is my copy of the cover is not on the PDF. So, Dad? It's all yours. Um, well, I think, you know, I, uh, I was born in 1930, and my books had an old high wooden uh, photograph cover. And uh, they had, for every record, uh, Jimmy Rogers and Singing Brakeman. Uh, which you may have heard of. Uh, he ever made, and he made most of his recordings in the 20s. And uh, so when he, uh, and I think that when I was about seven years old, I learned to run that phonograph and I played those Jimmy Rogers records, you know, every day probably. And I think that's what made me into a real enthusiast is Jimmy Rogers is singing breakfast. So that's just a uh, just plug for Jimmy Rogers. Um, uh, I, um, uh, that's the cover of the Duluth or Bus book, and my brother and I, we were farming. Uh, this one fall, we had our farm work done fairly early, and uh, we had a few weeks of, before we had to start getting up stove wood. <laughs> and uh, what made us think about going to Duluth, I don't know, because uh, that was during the Korean War, you know, and things were a little tight on the railroad, uh, especially if you were wandering around on it. So uh, we decided we were going to go to Duluth, and we had to find somebody to swap the hogs and milk the cows while we were gone. This was in 1952. Um, there is a picture I took of the pickup uh, the day before we left for Duluth, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, we got a home-built grain box on the back, 
uh, with a frame over the top and a carpet thrown over it, and there was a mattress inside that we slept on while we were gone. Um, so, uh, okay, Arch. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. This will be the last time I have to do this, but we don't have the cover on the. The old three. picture I took on the trip, uh, uh, that's a Milwaukee Road, uh, L3 Heavy Mikado, uh, and if you didn't know it, the, the first Mikado was built for Japan, the first wheel arrangement, and they were, um, um, and then the wheel arrangement became popular, and uh, so they've always been called Mikados, 282s. But during the war, um, they didn't like Japan, naturally, after Pearl Harbor. So a lot of railroads renamed their Mikados to be something else like the MacArthur or something like that. So um, that's uh, a picture of the Milwaukee Road uh, ferry type 262 in Minneapolis. And that's the Burlington. Uh, uh, old class that uh, sometimes pulled the zephyrs when they were the engine trailer. Uh, our chief is wrong about that. That is a Milwaukee Road extra train uh, headed from Minneapolis to Duluth on the Scally Line. And that's a uh, Northern Pacific work train in sighting there. And, uh, so I was, I was kind of proud to take this photo because it showed uh, the Milwaukee Road. To me, it was offline. Uh, I mean, they were leasing the line, but I didn't know at the time. Okay. Uh, that's some uh, Northern Pacific freight train at White Bear Lake. And that's Duluth, uh, Rises Point, looking over the Northern Pacific Roundhouse, right down there, right there. and. Uh, if you went far enough, you would cross the bridge into Superior, Wisconsin. Uh, that is later on. That's uh, Northern Pacific Deadline, new for scrap in, uh, in Rice's Point, uh, in probably about 58 or so. There's another one. Uh, uh, that is a two line passenger engine, and right down the road, railroad from the Union Station, they had a little engine terminal right there in the middle of nowhere because if they wanted to get an engine over from the Superior, Wisconsin, to their main base, they had about a five mile run, they had to cross the lake. So this engine was based right right behind the, that tower there and the, uh, um, I picked up a train just about a block, two blocks up, up the road there. Uh, that's a Northern Pacific train passing a work train at uh, um, somewhere north of Minneapolis. Uh, that is approaching the um, crossover with the Great Northern. Uh, this guy's got a clear board, so he's there. There's the semaphore. He's running about. Probably 45 miles an hour. Well, in case you didn't know, and I mean, some of you bought the book, but he just did as seen on the way. Okay, yeah, so well, that's, just, that, that, that's just pictures that he took of various railroads on the way to the Masabi, either in 52 or 53 or beyond. So now he's at the yeah, Masabi. That's taken about 9 o'clock at night. Uh, that's uh, my first view of Masabi train. He's right in the middle of the hill coming up out of Duluth. And I'm amazed that it turned out as good as it did, regardless of it. And that's another one taken up by ending on the yard. Uh, that's one of the Masabi passenger engines, uh, 400 types. Um, now there's uh, what the Masabi called a Mali, which it is an Mali. It's a simple engine, but it was a Mali in 1910. It was built as a, as a compound engine, and he is backing down. Uh, see, you can see a fully loaded ore train, 50, or 65 cars, 
and he's just just there ready to start down what I call the Proctor Hill. Uh, there's another one you can uh, see the brake shoe smoke when he gets near the bottom of the hill. Uh, that was almost gone stuck, and uh, so he's probably a mile from the ore dock. Um, and uh, the amount of brake shoe smoke that was showing depended on whether the wind was blowing or not. If the wind was blowing up the hill, it would take most of it away. In this case, apparently there's no wind, so you can see the plow, the brake shoe smoke that was generated by a heavily old ore train coming down the hill. Uh, there's the, when they brought the ore down, they brought about 65 miles. They couldn't pull 65 empties back up. So they had to send a, a train or an engine and a caboose down once in a while to take the extra ore cars back up the hill. Uh, this guy is pushing, uh, and I just imagine it's a locomotive transfer probably, but those cars are absolutely deep pushing. Uh, there's, there's he, he's been passed, and he's a little past me now. And there's the little bunny that was on the head end. That was a 2102, 500 class, Masabi. Uh, there's another down train uh, pulled by a, um, see, you can see the brake shoe smoke. There's hardly any of it there. Uh, that little bunny belonged to the Union Railroad, which was another U.S. Steel Railroad out of uh, Pittsburgh, and they went dieselized, so Masabi got the, got the locomotive. And there's another down train. Um, there's lots of brake shoe smoke, and uh, something that surprised me was that every train that came down the hill, the little more, ran in reverse. I don't know why they did, for sure, but uh, I never saw a train coming down the hill with a, with a full ore train, but one, the locomotive wasn't in reverse. Uh, that's on the cover of the book. That's a, a train, a locomotive, and come down to pick up extra ore cars, take back up the hill, and there's the pickup. See, sitting over there with the door open. <laughs> I had to get out of it pretty fast. Uh, this is about a mile from the ore dock. Oh, there's the Wasabi steam passenger train in Virginia, Minnesota. Uh, they ran, they called them the Arrowhead Resorters, was the name of the train. Uh, they ran for miles through the Taylor's piles up on the range, you know, piles of waste everywhere. Uh, that's, that little money came from the Bessemer and Lake Erie, which was in a very U.S. steel road. And, uh, when they dieselized the Masabi, just like the Union Switchers, they, they got the um, Bessemer and Lake Erie, and they were huge locomotives. Uh, this guy is right in the middle of the hill upgrade, and he's showing a pretty clear stack considering. So. And there's another down train, uh, a caboose hop. Uh, that's an alley going into Proctor. The, uh, Old roundhouse and the chopper are uh, just to the right of that train there. So there's a molly getting the, the caboose is probably just leaving the ore dock way back there. Uh, getting ready to start up the hill, and there's the Union Switcher uh, and starting up the hill. Uh, now there is you can you see the cylinder that that is a molly locomotive a compound. Uh, Steam in those went to the rear cylinder, and then uh, instead of the exhausting up, up the stack, it was taken into the huge front cylinder, so they thought they got double work out of the steam, not that locomotive generator. Uh, there were three of them left in uh, 1952. They were sitting there. Uh, that's another picture of the first one in line there. You see how complicated that is? That's the other side of it. Um, now this one, if you look closely, you can see the uh, Mali number 203, I think. And right over there is a Yellowstone type that just came down with the road of war from the range and is coming through to the roundhouse with the crew riding on the pilot. See that? That's a, just a regular, you can see how high the 
started in Eastern Arizona. Uh, and a little break shoe smoke and that same train after it went by. You can see how it's running in reverse. Uh, that is a 10 couple switcher, 10, uh, 10 drivers, you know. Uh, and he's out there sorting out our cars. And that's a, a tiny eight couple of money. Uh, there weren't too many of those around. And that's a, a consolidation that they use probably on mine runs. A little a small locomotive that could get out in the brush and pick up those bullets. Uh, that's another 10 couple switcher, the number 90. 93, sorry. <laughs> and now this, they told me that, that the driver tires on that locomotive were damaged. It's a union switcher, what I call it. Union switcher, and so they have taken uh, the brake shoes, uh, brake shoes out of the hands there by the drivers, and they substituted brake shoes with notches in them that they can put the carbide cutters in. So when they get ready to get that all set up, they uh, move that locomotive with the lurcher with a motor, uh, and uh, the carbide cutters are supposed to true up the faces of the tires. Uh, I don't know what, yeah, I guess it works all right, but, uh, that's one of their, that's a, just about as big as a big boy, uh, really pathetic, so uh, they can pull 114,000, or 114 cars, or 50 ton iron ore cars on the line from uh, Hibbing, Minnesota, down to the Ordock. So you know how, there's another one. Uh, that's another, I call them Texas types, because that's what they were, Called most places a uh, 4102. Um, this is a, a Mali, or they call it a Mali, in the um, Iron Ore country, passing a uh, load of uh, scrap rock. And there's a Mali coming, or he's made it up the hill and he's coming into the yard. Uh, that's a union, I call them a union switcher. They were made specifically for the Union Railroad, the U.S. Uh, Steel subsidiary. And uh, that train is, uh, you can see he's standing there, uh, just starting up the hill and right, at, right back off of the caboose is where, you, where they turn to go onto the Ordock town on the Ore. So there's another up train with a Texas pipe. They were really hammering when they were in this position. Here's a little one. Uh, that, that is upgrade. You can see how steep the grade was. Uh, there's a Texas type that Miss Hubby got from the BNLE, and you can see it's uh, done in gray paint. The only one I ever saw. Uh, that's a standard Texas type. Another Union Switcher. Another one. Another one. There's the Yellowstone. Um, probably right at the very first or second spot of the most powerful steam locomotive ever built. That's a thick or Santa Fe type um, put on horse service for some reason. It was kind of late for that. Okay, Tom, tell them about, so, that was 52. Tell them about trying to get the photo permit uh, and doing things legally up there uh, with the blessing of the railroad and uh, about all the police, oh. railroad policemen and how you ended up with this builder's place that we didn't have time to get off your wall. Well, when we, when we got there, I didn't know what to do, so we went to the Missouri offices and uh, everybody said no, but they let us go up to the next highest officer and finally we were in the superintendent, uh, superintendent of Moody Power's office and uh, you know he talked about 15 minutes about how dangerous he was and everything and I told him I knew all that. Finally he got a little card like you'd write a note on and he said this truck is authorized to go onto railroad property to take pictures of Steve Lopez. And so I you know 
I didn't know how it would work, but I got jumped about probably five or six times by the civil agents. They'd save me out somewhere, you know, and, and as soon as I read that card, everything was fine. So, uh, which I really surprised me. It's all about losing the card. <laughs> Telling about how about the card getting tore up. Oh, that's much later. Well, I know, but well, anyhow, um, in 1960, I was up there. Saw some locomotives sitting over in the brush. Went over there. Uh, they were they had the rods cut and everything ready for scrap. And uh, there was a pedestrian overwalk across the yard right there. And I was taking pic uh, one picture of each. And uh, I heard this noise. And this special agent was coming across the bridge, uh, yelling at me. And uh, so he came down and he said, "What the hell do you think you're doing here?" And I said, well, taking pictures of these engines. Um, well, you're not even supposed to be on this property. So I had my card that uh, I got 10 years before that. I opened my book and taped, it was taped in there. And he, he looked at it. He said, that was only good for one day. And he ripped it out. And I got a man, you know. Uh, so as I was driving back out of the yard, I thought, I'm just going to stop by to see my old print superintendent and go to the car again. <laughs> and uh, so I worked my way up to him and I told him my story. And uh, of course he didn't. He took another card out. He wrote something on it. He, he said, uh, take this down to the storekeeper down on the first floor. In the meantime, uh, he had a big window on the side of his office. You could look down in the repair bay and see about 15 locomotives down there being repaired. But uh, when I took it down there and gave it to the guy, he went back somewhere back in the dark and he came out with a box about this size and handed it to me and I thought, what in the heck is this? And so I took it out to the car and I put it in the trunk and opened it up and it was a Baldwin Builders plate off a steam locomotive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, wow. and those are prized property for anybody to get a hold of one. With, with and Paul, I think he saw he, that it hangs in his den and it's a little yeah. heavy to cart around. He um, gave me that one just to get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so 53. 50, 52, yeah. Now There's um, Masami's new movie power for passengers. Uh, they call it an RDC car thing. Uh, that's at the end of the yarn. And there's another shot of it. It's on the turntable. <coughs> and uh, I never did see one in service, but I now where we took those pictures at 70th Avenue e uh, West, um, believe it or not, the ore dock is way down there somewhere. This is what happens when you get a down train with bad brakes or with brakes that are smoking and a little light fog and no, no wind. See how the, the observation there is probably about 100 feet. Now there's an up train. Um, if you look real closely, you can see the locomotive right up there on the point, and that, that takes in the whole train there. That was a X Blue uh, Street car that the Masavi had somehow got a hold of and they turned it into a diesel car to transport employees from one roundhouse to the other. Uh, they called it the Jitney. Now there's, there's the following, uh, it's the 3 p.m. shift change. The <coughs> locomotive with the steam coming out of it, that's the 210 too. And he is pulling those other locomotives underneath the coal chute. Uh, next you have a Texas type, uh, then you have a, I think a 10 wheel switcher, and then the last one you can barely see, I think is one of those simple mileage. Well, that was quite a sight. Uh, that's the Union Railroad with a down train, not much brake shoe smoke. A uh, simple mile uh, headed back up the hill. Uh, they're looking down on West Duluth there, and right uh, here's a down train right there on the Masabi coming down the hill. You can bear it, it's hard to see. But, and there, and there's one going up the hill. So that's uh, Duluth Harbor, part of Duluth Harbor in the background. Now there, 
Let's see who's a switcher with a down train. See he's running in reverse. Uh, you can see the whole train, but you can make up the blue sector and then less curve. So that, that was a whole, a whole load of iron ore. Well, that's a Texas type, uh, starting back up the hill. Uh, this was taken about 9 o'clock at night. And there's the, uh, no, the locomotive that has just got repaired. See it, Art? No, over there, right there. They then put the switcher, and they're bringing it out of the house. And this is about 9, nine o'clock at night, and it was painted up to the blue and blaze, no, it was painted up. Um, this was uh, the line out of two harbors to the Iron Range and uh, it crossed uh, the Nasabi Duluth line there and it also crossed no large, no, not yet. Um, across Highway 61 right ahead of the locomotive there and it was raining and uh, that guy was having a tough time getting that train up the hill. <laughs> okay. That's uh, the Trojan pit over by uh, Evelyn. And you can see a, uh, an ore train over there on the other side. There I am, staring face to face with the monster. <laughs> Except my brother took that picture. Uh, that's another picture of the ship change with a, a Mally, a Union Switcher, and a Ben Couple Switcher right there. And there being towed underneath the coal lock to get filled up the coal. Um, that picture is a, a Texas type and then you just that that curve back there is where the hill starts down the hill. Uh, there's another Texas type and you can see how he's blasting up the hill. Well it was most of the roundhouse taken from an old overpass that used to be there but it's torn it was torn down. That's very early in the morning. That's another class of locomotive that the Nassau uh, got from the Elgin Joliet the Eastern, which was another uh, U.S. steel load. And he's switching the West Tractor Yard about 7 o'clock in the morning. That's one of the Yellowstones of a little polling station just outside of Hitting, Minnesota. Um, that was the home base for them because that's where they hooked them onto the long iron ore train so they came down to the box. That's a uh, close up of the uh, locomotive part of the Mallee number 210, which is not a Mallee, is a simple articulated. So here's that fan trip that I showed you. On my July the 5th. 1958. Uh, yeah, I drove all night with, with my family to get to uh, Proctor to get on a Nassau fan trip. And uh, that's, that's the local video they had for it. Uh, see, it's sitting in the Indian yard, which was east of uh, downtown Duluth. And see, they got people swimming all over checking things. And uh, it was an interesting day. And there's the train uh, really climbing one of the uh, trestles of the, of the um, lake shore line. They loaded me into the Proctor Roundhouse in 1962. Uh, all these pictures were taken in that um, roundhouse. You can see there's an alley. There's a Elden Valley in Eastern Mercado. Uh, there's the Union Switcher. Uh, you can tell the distinct smoke box on it because it's. And there's the drivers. Uh, and the air pumps. <laughs> uh, there's the front end of a couple of valleys, 227. And the if, you, if you've ever been to the Duluth uh, Museum in the basement of the old Union Station, when we were up there two years ago and Dad, Dad and I just went up, he presented last year, but we were sitting there going through the, their equipment and one of the guys asked Dad, do you have anything in this museum? Do you have anything of it under power? And Dad couldn't think that he did. And then 
we remember we were going through some old photographs and the 227 is the big engine that they do have so we at least have the front number plate number plate of the 227 which mm -hmm. is in Duluth in the museum below the Union Station there. Uh, let's see. Uh, from the end of uh, one of the Texas sites, the 703, and there's another Maui. Uh, there was about 10 more movies in that, I guess. Uh, there's a guy. I assume they're getting this locomotive ready for relief in case they have an engine failure. Uh, there's some more. Uh, there's only brand new paint. Uh, that's a couple years later, and they had all the old souls on the deadlines, getting ready to cut them out. This was the only the sprinter, the biggest was the only in the world. There is a great northern or or engine. It's a uh, was built in 1909 as a compound alley. Uh, they assembled it in um, probably the 20s, but you can see the wheel range of it is a two, six, eight, oh. <laughs> Very antique. And there it is on our run, headed out into the woods. Uh, that's a great northern, uh, when you bring it in a, a ore to be shipped uh, to pressure. Uh, it's a 2880, and it was also built as a compound uh, back in the 1910s. So. And that's the Great Northern Deadline in Superior. There's probably 40 engines out there all together, something made for scrap. There's the Duluth of Northeastern with a Masabi, ex Masabi engine. That was Back in 1900, that was their big, big power. Was that uh, locomotive there? I know there were 50 of them just like it. That was an uh, industry down on the uh, Duluth Harbor. Uh, that's a <coughs> six-wheel switcher switching a specialty steel company. That that company made uh, specially hard. Her, uh, steel and stuff for people that had special orders. Uh, there's a locomotive that switched the uh, mines up on the Iron Range called the Hoyt Mining Company. There's uh, the Lake Superior Terminal and Transfers, the Moose Line Up, they had four of them. There's one of their locomotives in an uh, eight wheel switcher. And there is, I don't know where that came from. Uh, <laughs> it was a diesel. <laughs> it's on the, what the Masabi called the Spirit Lake Transfer Railroad. And it descended from West Duluth across the river, St. Louis River, uh, over to uh, South Superior. Uh, and they used that to transfer iron ore from the Duluth uh, area clear over to uh, South and Superior, Wisconsin. Um, I don't know much about the history of the railroad, although it was controlled by the DM and I are. Well, I know that for sure. Um, there's a map of the system. So, and that, that's, it. that's part of my, the subject collection. <laughs> so. And we always, in our program, hopefully early, we did pretty good. Um, and want to know if there's any questions? Yeah, any questions? Yeah, on Masabi or anything else you know you might know. Yeah. Um, How many stalls were in the roundhouse with the Masabi? Oh, I think about uh, 27, something like that. It was nearly a full circle. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, if you wanted, back in those days, in 52 and 53, if you wanted to see heavy steam, that was the place to go. <laughs> Got a question over here now. Cecil, so how, how did you discover the, the Masabi growing up where, where you did? What was, your, what was your initiation to it? Well, the initiation was try to get a permit. <laughs> but I mean, did you discover it in Trains Magazine or something? Yeah. Or what, what, what drew you uh, up there? Railroad Magazine, Railroad? Think, yeah, which is now defunct. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
my, uh, I was very nervous about what we were going to do when we got there, you know, because I knew the railroad detectives would be thicker than thieves uh, during the Korean War. But I was lucky. I got that permit, written in pencil. <laughs> um, and uh, the railroad detectives, uh, they'd come, they'd come racing towards me with their little Ford cars, you know, and after the first one, I pretty much knew what to expect. They'd look at it and say, oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, which really surprised me. But my, I think the highlight probably was later on when with the being given that builder's plate, you know, a brass builder's plate, this thing. Uh, they called it the big bowl of it. And then later on, they changed it to a smaller one. Uh, and I, I got it hanging on the wall at home. <laughs> yeah. Cecil, in 1962, when you were at the roundhouse there taking the pictures inside, how many of those engines were still in service? Were they still no. using steam then? Except that one, uh, he's only, I'm oily. Yeah. Well, it was a um, it was a Elden Jolly at the Eastern 282, and they probably were making sure that it was steamed up and ready in case of uh, relieving something somewhere. You know, mm -hmm. others were dead and and stayed that way. <laughs> Do you know when the uh, steam last ran on the Masabi, or does anybody know? I. Uh, I think it was, um, it was probably uh, 60 or 61 when the last steam run, you know. Um, the Burlington ran, a, uh, in conjunction with a couple of fan clubs, ran uh, our excursions up there, you know. They ran along the Burlington, uh, along the Mississippi from, and uh, so they, uh, they did that maybe a few years longer, but uh, it wasn't anything, you know, that the railroad, well, they furnished the locomotive, but, and uh, so you didn't want to try and chase one of those fan trips along the Mississippi, on the Burlington, because the track was A1, and the roads were terrible, <laughs> and uh, I just uh, come close to getting hit by one long time. Because I went on the prairie machine, the paper said they were going to have one going through, taking pants to glue. And when I got the prairie machine, they had the uh, fire hose all watering the tinder. And I knew that north of prairie machine, there was only a few places where you could get on the sunny side of the train in the afternoon, you know, the rest. Of so I, I leisurely on the prairie machine, went about three miles, uh, pulled over on the right hand side of the highway and uh, opened the car door and got out of the car and started across the highway and I heard the train coming already. I mean, so I battled my way down down the slope to the tracks through brush, of course, and uh, when I got to the track, I looked down, here he came, you know. <laughs> so I jumped across the track. In the meantime, I knew, it, and I was adjusting my camera as I went, and when I got down there, I turned around, flipped around, snapped it. Didn't even know what I got. I got a good one, believe it or not. You know, so <laughs> he was running about 70 already then. <laughs> For that 62 trip, didn't they have 5632 take the train to, to St. Paul and then, what was it, the Copper Co Country Limited or something? Uh, I'm not sure what they did beyond St. Paul because uh, the time I went to write it, we, uh, it was, 11, 12 o'clock at night, the night before the, the train ride, so, yeah. Uh, I always thought they took a turn to Duluth, but I'm not sure. Uh, there, there was a very, it was a line from White Bear Lake to um, uh, Duluth was uh, owned and operated by the um, Northern Pacific. And um, Milwaukee had trackage rights over it, so. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. Yeah.